Yeah, so uh, these slides, I literally made them uh, almost a year ago, August 16th. Uh, PayPal has this internal group called the Machine Learning Guild. And this talk was part of the very first one, the very first meeting of the group. Um, so I got a, I'm, I'm going to have to like remember a little bit how this stuff works, but I think it will be okay. Anyway, so yeah, you guys know all that stuff. And get, come on, there we go. So first I'm going to go over like the background, like why did I need to do time series forecasts? Um, like what was the business reason? Um, what were like the challenges with the data that we had? What were we trying to predict? I'm going to talk about like the model that I came up with and kind of then talk about like how the results turned out. And then at the end, I got time for Q&A and I got like a couple like things that I don't have in slides, but I want to talk about. Like basically, I don't want to put them in writing, but I want them to be known. So like background, um, PayPal, Braintree, we let people pay for things online. Uh, so it turns out like in the background, a lot of what we're doing is just duct taping banks together. And so we had this project with Australia working with the National Australia Bank, it's like the biggest bank there. And like the long story short is we were trying to manually, <clears throat> we ended up like manually moving money around for a while. And the finance team had put together this model in Excel and it was just really bad. So like the one on the right, that green line is like the actual day-to-day -day account balance. And then the blue line is what their forecast said it was gonna be. So you can see like not even close. Uh, uh, in addition, like, to it not being a good forecast. They also ran into like the hashtag big data problem. They were writing a query against Redshift to get the data. It got to be more rows than Excel could reasonably handle. I think it was like up to almost like half a gig of size for the workbook. And so like they had, they had to like rent giant servers just to run this thing in Excel. It was pretty funny. But so I, I stepped in and I was like, yeah, I think I can make this better. Um, so the modeling challenges, like what, what was the hard part? Uh, so it turns out like I was trying to forecast a thousand different customers and we call them merchants because they're businesses that have their own customers, um, but there are customers anyway. So we, we have like a thousand ones. I'm trying to forecast all of them. Uh, so really what I thought was it's better to have a different forecast for each single one but the finance team doesn't care about the individuals. They care about the overall total that's gonna um, end up in that bank account. So, well, I should probably should have crossed out those two big merchants because they call them out by name. But um, my point was like those two big merchants are way bigger than all the other customers we have in Australia. So they have like really significant effects on the overall total that, uh, would have to be weighted higher. Um, and then like lastly, like there are really weird holidays in Australia. So like they have their normal bank holidays, but for the customers that we have, there's like sporting events that last for weeks on end that uh, really affect like these merchants who uh, let you gamble on sporting events. Uh, and the sporting events are like not stuff that's popular in the US. So it'd be things like uh, cricket or like horse racing, just gigantically popular in Australia. Um, on the data side, like we had really good uh, data pipelines for everything that we controlled, like when transactions were started and finished. And we had really horrible data pipelines for when things actually happened on the bank end. So a lot of like what we do is just create APIs. And so we'll send requests back and forth. That stuff was awesome. The data is perfect. So I get very fine grained, accurate data for what we were trying to do. But what the actual results in the bank on the other end uh, might happen like a week later, which is ridiculous. Like usually it's pretty instant within a couple seconds, but sometimes they'll come back a week later and say, oh yeah, by the way, we did complete that one. So you'll have to go back and update your record. Or we did reject that transaction. Um, sorry, we told you we approved it before. Uh, so kind of like I needed to have some flexibility I needed to have uh, a way to have a, like an error, like some uncertainty. 
So I decided to use Profit because I was like, I don't really want to fine tune an individual time series model using Arima or any of the other like exponential time series smoothing. Um, I didn't want to like use one of those kind of tried and true methods a thousand times over and customize them each for it. I wanted something that was kind of be good enough uh, automatically. And Profit said it could do that. Um, so like as Profit pitches it, it's like accurate, automatic, tunable, and it's in Python. It's like checked all my boxes. Um, so like I'm going to go real quick over these. It's just about like what I wanted out of Profit specifically and why I thought it was cool. It was like the seasonal decomposition, I needed that because all of the businesses, the thousand businesses I'm trying to forecast, they have different patterns. Some have very like week over week repetitive, some are month over month, some are like completely sporadic. And I needed to be able to split that out individually for them. And Profit does that for you automatically. Uh, the change point detection, like some of the customers we have, they might not give us all of their uh, transaction volume all at once. So usually you would think, okay, well you onboarded this customer, they're gonna start processing on your system Great. But what ends up happening is they want to test like 10% at first. And then maybe two months later, they're going to bump it up to 20%. And then they're going to jump to 50%. And so they have these very step level increases. I didn't want to have to like create a time, like a hash table of the times of when they onboarded and increase their volume and look that up every time. I wanted the time series detection to just say, yep, yeah, step level change, new, new forecast starting from here on out. And Profit does that. Uh, and then lastly are these like holiday effects. And this was brought up in like the chat for the questions on the last talk. Uh, and I actually had to make my own custom holidays for a lot of these people. Specifically, I talked about those gambling merchants. Um, so like in the fall, I have, you know, whatever, these like five or 10 gambling customers, they get like a whole holiday for like those, you know, six weeks that it's important. Uh, and then everybody else has their own special holidays. So that might not be a traditional, like it's Christmas or it's Easter or, you know, the Independence Day or whatever. It could be, it's their biannual sale. It could be something very specific to the business that's not specific to the world overall. Um, cool. Uh, and then I wanted to like, see if the regressions were additive or mul multiplicative. And it's basically saying like, is the trend increasing over time or is it pretty static? It turned out like this actually didn't really matter for me. Almost every single forecast I had was um, additive, which is kind of your traditional like linear pattern. Uh, but I wanted it just in case in confidence interval. So this is what I was talking about where I needed to have some uncertainty. I needed to know like, all right, well, here's what it's forecasting. But also, like, it could be anywhere between these upper and lower bounds. So when I aggregate all that together, I might say today we should see, you know, uh, $10 million go into the bank, but expect it to be anywhere between 8 and 12 in reality. Cool. So um, this is how it actually ended up happening. I had a very straightforward process. I uh, set up... Uh, Google Sheet with our project managers, and they put in the migration plan, like when when these new customers would start processing on the new platform, and then the data would go into our warehouse, which was Redshift, and I would query it and get all the the data back for all the customers, and then I would loop through all of them and generate a forecast for them individually. I'd combine all those forecasts into an Excel file, and then I would send it over to our finance team. We call them FinOps, finance operations. That's what that means there. Uh, and so, you know, every week the finance team would see this file show up in their uh, network drive and they would review it. And if it looked like things would be okay, they said, great. Hey, PayPal finance team, here's our automated forecast. It looks like things will be good. And if it looked like maybe we we're gonna overdraft, they would say, hey, can we have some more money please? Um, so that's kind of like what how this actually got used. And on the right, you see my chart. Like, uh, let me go back to the old one real quick. So 
here, like green was actual blue as the old forecast based on Excel. It's pretty bad. Ooh, okay. And then here, like green is actual blue as my forecast. Uh, and you can see mine fits a lot tighter. Uh, mine did kind of get a little wonky. Uh, part of that is because the project manager migration plan in Google Sheets didn't actually happen the way they put it out there. So like we were expecting more people to onboard and they just delayed it. But for the most part, it's huge, huge improvement, much more stable, much more reliable. Uh, cool, so I know you guys cannot see this, it's tiny, but on the left, it's just the tree structure for my project. I've got a data folder, I've got a docs folder, I've got K2, AU forecast, that's my Python module. That's where all my code goes. I'll talk about that in the next slide. You need to concentrate on it for now. I have a reports folder. This is where the output from the forecast gets dumped. I have a scripts. So like these are like just random things that I think need to, uh, that I like would, I would just say like Python run this script and it'll automate something for me. It's not really part of the process, but it's more, uh, you know, glue work, I guess. Uh, and I have a test folder, like testing that my functions work, that my uh, the integration tests between the databases are good, networks, stuff like that. And then lastly, I've got that vnv folder, and that's a virtual environment. That's the package that comes with Python 3.4 and on by default. So you can create uh, specific dependencies uh, private to your own project. I don't know if that's a good way to explain it. You guys can Google it. Cool, anyway, so like what, all right, I have all this code here, what what do I do with it? Well, I set up a make file. Make is a tool to, I guess, like automate a series of instructions. So I have a target install, a target refresh data, a target forecast parallel, and a target report. And they kind of do what those names imply. Install sets up PyEnv and the virtual environment, and installs all the dependencies, refresh data, says use that query template to go get data from Redshift and download it into the local directory. Forecast Parallel then uh, uses that uh, file that Redshift, that we got from Redshift and loops through it and generates a forecast for each of the customers inside it. And it does it in parallel. Uh, and then report takes all of the outputs from the reports folder and combines it into an Excel file uh, to drop into the finance team shared drive. Uh, I also had some like make targets that were not really part of the like the automated run process, but they were useful for development. So I had configure, which is like set up your passwords for Redshift and things like that. Like any like changes you wanted to make uh, for environment variables. Uh, clear, which just deletes all the files in the reports, so that when you go and run the make report, it doesn't work, doesn't combine old files. I had to make progress just because like when you're running a thousand forecasts in parallel, I don't really know how far along it is. I was it's like, anyway, uh, I had IPython, which just starts up a REPL that's based from this VNV uh, virtual environment and then make tests, which would run all the tests. Let me know if my code deviated or things weren't able to connect through the network or whatever. Um, cool, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is that K2 AU forecast uh, module. Real quick, I'm just gonna go through the files that are in there. I had a custom holidays.py, and this is where I was able to say, uh, you know, here's like the series of dates that are gonna be the gambling season. Here are the dates and times for, um, I don't know, like any specific customer holidays. Like here's their biannual sale. Here's, um, you know, their billing, their monthly like billing subscription date. Uh, and to make the custom holidays, all I did was create a dict. And I put the key name as like the name of the holiday, such as gambling season or, you know, customer name, biannual sale. And then the values was a pandas data frame with a column DS. That was a date time that had a, the dates that the, uh, that should be considered as variables as holidays in the model. Um, I have a date calculator. This is just to do bank math. Um, it's kind of kind of dumb, but uh, 
the Excel model had this function like Workday International or something, which lets you add and subtract dates, but on, but like in business days, but in for international schedule versus a US holiday schedule. And I could not find a way to do this in Python exactly, but NumPy has like a business day method that I kind of hacked. So that's what date calculator does. Uh, forecast.py is like the meat of it. I'm gonna present more on the functions there in the next slide. Uh, I have Japan holidays because we have a couple merchants that just do transactions in Japanese yen. And the dependency I used for different country holidays uh, was really messed up for Japan. Uh, I have query template. That's just what go like that's a SQL that goes and runs against Redshift. Uh, and then I have Redshift Connect, which is how to connect to that. And then lastly, I've got settings.py. And so in the previous talk, Anissa talked about like being able to plug in parameters to your your forecast uh, like constructor, like when you initiate the class. Uh, that's what settings.py does. It's a way to say like these specific customers have have weird defaults that I want to set, um, and then everybody else will get a standard standard parameters. Cool. So that forecast module, the meat of like the work for building the forecast, I said merchant df, which is just like take that giant Redshift output and filter to just the specific customer that it's looking at. I have a daily data frame function, which sometimes um, the way I wrote my query, I would end up with like multiple days because there were different dimensions um, in my group by statement and I didn't pivot them out. So this just kind of pivots it to get a, a by date data frame that has the columns that profit expects. Uh, get holidays, kind of what it says. Like it, you pass it like what kind of named holidays you want to pull from the custom holidays, and it goes and fetches those dates and sends it into that to reuse in profit and building the model. Uh, I have trend forecast that just calls the dot fit on it, and I have predict forecast which calls dot predict, and then I have the build the forecast data frame. And so really what this final thing does is it uses the forecast it constructed and then puts it in a slightly different format that finance asked me to do. So, uh, you know, profit has like your Y hat and all that stuff. Finance is like, I don't know what Y hat is. So I just like renaming columns. That's like the gist of it. Cool. Um, this is an output. So normally I would just call make forecast parallel, but this is a, like what that command calls. Um, it just loops through all of them. And so you can kind of see that when I did it one at a time, so I said, generate the forecast for this specific customer. And I gave them like a plugged in their random UUID and it's profit starts logging all this weird stuff. Initial log joint probability equals a negative seven points. They're like, I don't know what this is. Um, so profits built on top of this uh, library called PyStan, which is an interface to Stan, which is like a statistical Bayesian modeling software. Uh, so yeah, it, I don't know. I tried to turn off logging so hard and it just wouldn't let me do it. I couldn't override it. Um, normally you should be able to say, hey, use the logging for this module and set it to just error. And the profit library actually has it hard coded in that it's going to do info no matter what, which is, I think, a bug. And I tried to file an issue for it. And they said, yeah, it's not a bug. It's a feature. But anyway, like you can see, like my gold font here, um, calling each merchant's or each customer's forecast one at a time would take roughly 10 to 20 seconds. So it's not super long, but I had to do it a thousand times over. I didn't want to sit there for six hours a day. I wanted to be as fast as possible. So I leveraged this tool called GNU Parallel. So GNU, the new like Linux software. Um, and basically you just say new parallel, this text file of commands. And it says, well, how many CPUs do you have? I'm going to run that many at a time. Uh, so really cheap and easy way to parallelize Python. Cool. So the tools I used, um, I use Microsoft. VS Code as a text editor. Mostly I did that because I was pair programming with another guy on my team. 
and he was not very comfortable with them, um, which is fine. VS Code is awesome. It worked out really well. Uh, we could do like that collaborative live share. Like he lives in SF and I'm in Chicago. I told you about how I used Makefile. I use that for both the CLI and the automation, you run all of these steps back to back to back. The Python specific stuff I use. So I use Python 3.7.3. I use VN for virtual environment management. Obviously I use Profit. I use Pandas for data frames because Profit expects them. Uh, but also Pandas just makes it easy to query and pivot and reshape data. I use NumPy specific for the business day offset. I use this library work calendar. So remember how I told you that I made that Japan holidays script or module? Uh, I actually push, push that up to this library work calendar as an open source contribution. So if somebody else wants to use holidays to for Japan, they don't have to write it themselves. Uh, I use black to format my code. I use PsychoPG to connect to Redshift. Open PyXL for writing to an Excel file. I use PyTest for testing and IPython as like debugging and REPL stuff. Cool, so that's like my talk. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was why did you just write one query to Redshift and then hit that CSV file over and over again? Well, it turns out that Redshift has a limit of like 50 connections at a time and most Redshift DB admins will limit each user to a certain number of slots or queues. And my user was limited to one slot. So at first I did try and write the queries to like run in parallel, but they just ran sequentially anyway because how our database is set up. So it's actually easier for me to write like one query and get all the data and then operate on a the file output in parallel. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is like, why didn't I do more specific modeling? Well, I had to do a thousand, right? So like, that's a lot, but more importantly, I don't know. I don't know anything about these businesses. I'm not like a time series expert. I really kind of just wanted the 80, 20 rule. I wanted something that was good enough and that would, you know, be better than the Excel model that they had built before. And this accomplished the goal 100%. The downside of this is well, didn't you get some bad production predictions in production then? Yeah, absolutely. When COVID-19 hit, whoa, we went, we went from being like usually within maybe like 2% accuracy on the overall portfolio to being only uh, like 85% of the total. Um, the actual was only 85% of our forecast. And that 15% swing resulted in a huge like bank overdraft because they were like, the forecast looks good. We don't need any money. And then the money didn't come back and we had already paid out our customers. So things to keep in mind, uh, pandemics don't show up in holidays. But yeah, that's my talk. I hope it was fun. Oh, that was great. Uh, can we please give Ray a round of applause in the chat? Let me just paste my emojis. All right, uh, here we go. Oh uh, yeah, so we did have a few questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the first one is about your makefile. So people do love your makefile. I think you might have had a talk about a makefile a little while ago. I sure do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you do? You, uh, do you have like a public makefile template for people to use? Uh, I don't know if I do, but I do have my talk on makefiles. So I can post that. Cool. Yeah, so we will get that link shared uh, both on the meetup as well as this YouTube. Uh, so again, we have another question from Michael. Michael, I just want to give a shout out for uh, participating so much uh, in tonight's event. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, so for holidays, can they be one off or uh, are they only one off or they, can they also be uh, reoccurring? Oh, they can totally be reoccurring. Uh, so um what's a good example um like the day after christmas boxing day is like in canada a big thing and like is sometimes a thing in australia uh so f for like some of our customers it was really important and some it was not it was not part of like the default holidays that uh i got out of profit so i just said you know take 
Christmas and add one day and then uh, create that year over year. So like really when you're creating your custom holidays, you're giving it specific dates. Okay, so it's like, or you, so, so it's like using yeah, a generator whatever, to whatever generate dates those you dates. Want to. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so yeah, Mike, so part of my date calculator module actually does that. It like, well, you can say like create holidays for this specific region or this specific thing this far into the future. Got it. Okay. And so when you're using profit, like how many periods do you need to have like effective predictions? Uh, I tried to use two years of data. Uh, that didn't always work because some customers would just stop using us and then start back up six months later. Uh, some would want to get predictions after a month of being on the platform. This is kind of all over the place. I think, honestly, it depends on how far forward you want to go. If you're trying to predict the next 30 days and you've only got 30 days of history, you can totally do it. It's just going to have a very wide confidence interval, meaning it's going to have a lot of uncertainty. It's also not going to know the seasonality from you know years past, from different yeah. months. Yeah, that makes sense. So I actually had a question. Like you mentioned you're using PyTest. How do you think about testing this kind of like workflow? How do I think about testing what? Like, how do you think about testing like time series analysis? Like what is like, are you just sort of like setting a seed and like assuming that information is coming? Like, I'm, I'm not too sure like how to ask the question. Like I don't deal a lot with like data science, but it's like, that's an, like, how do you test time series analysis? <laughs> really dumb test. Did it give me a negative output? Not a good output, right? Um, I don't know, like basically like ways you can do it is like have, um, kind of like a very dumb forecast, like just predict a straight line and mm -hmm. then say like, well, how far off was it? How bad is the R squared or like measure of fit? Um, and then like have like a minimum threshold for that. I, I didn't do a lot of smart tests for actually on the predictive outputs because it is really hard and I didn't really want to think about it too much. Most of my tests were like unit tests on my functions. Like mm -hmm. is my math good? Is my, yeah. uh, is my date calculator thing working right? You know, is my connection to AWS like getting messed up? Yeah, I mean, like that. Those kind of like deterministic tests are like sort of what it's like what it's all about. I uh, just to sort of plug our next talk. Sean was mentioning his project has a hundred percent code coverage, so uh, just gonna sort of see what that's all about too. Uh, but uh, before nice. we do let you go, uh, do you have any uh, like calls to action or words of wisdom for uh, for the chippy community? Um. Probably, but I can't remember because I'm not sleeping very much. Okay, yeah, I mean, like you have a lot more on your mind, but like we do appreciate you taking your time out of uh out of your very very busy schedule to uh, to give this talk. So uh, thanks again. Can we please give Ray a round of applause in the chat? All right, Ray, thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you around.